psilocybin was superior, numerically superior, on many dimensions, anxiety, depression, but also well-being, a sense of flourishing, with a really different side effect profile. And so we, you know, I think we're really, really focused on, let's see what happens when we have the industrial strength, so to speak, study. That'll be out at the end of the year, but, you know, there's a lot of promising signals. Hey there, Midas Letter viewers, traders, subscribers, and investors. Today, my guest is George Goldsmith. He's the CEO of Compass Pathways PLC, trades on NASDAQ under the symbol CMPS. George, welcome. Thanks so much, James. Great to be part of this uh, discussion. I know you've been really uh, advancing the uh, focus on this field, so appreciate being part of the conversation. You bet. George, can we start with an overview of the business of Compass Pathways, please? Sure. We are a mental health care company really focused on accelerating patient access to evidence-based innovation in mental health. And I think this is, every word is important. We're in a huge, huge crisis right now, have been for quite a while, of mental health burden. COVID's made that worse. And so when we talk about accelerating patient access, people need new additional approaches because what we have just doesn't work for enough people. And so innovation is critical. And we're really believing that psilocybin therapy, psilocybin coupled with psychological support and digital um, tools can really, really help be a new tool to help patients who haven't been helped before. And, and that requires a lot of evidence. So, you know, we're really dedicated to doing the good hard work of clinical trials. Right now we're completing a very large, the largest trial ever done with psychedelics in 10 countries, 22 sites. And that'll be the basis for moving forward into the final phase, phase three, to bring this to patients. Wow. That's great. So then how far are we away in the time frame until this can be regularly prescribed in your opinion? Well, it's a hard question to answer because data matter and uh, we don't have those data yet. But based on the earlier studies, I think that, you know, we have a view that the development process here is perhaps less risky than we've seen in other medicines where we don't have this long history. And there's been quite a long history of psilocybin research. It's just never been to done to the level of standard and the size that's required to make it accessible to patients. So it's a hard question to answer until we have the results of our phase 2B. But if everything went really, really well, we would imagine 2025 as being a time when the trials, the regulatory approvals were there and people were actually able outside of trials to benefit. Of course, one of the things that happens today is with clinical trials, we are able to help those who respond. And even that's very gratifying to be able to do that work uh, while we're testing this and seeing who benefits and for how long. Sure. I'm, I'm kind of surprised at how the whole regulatory landscape has just done like a complete 180 degree about face in its attitude towards what have formerly been listed as schedule one drugs. And I'm curious as to what drove that sudden about face at the regulatory level, because that's not really consistent with the attitudes that characterize regulators historically. Well, look, I think part of this is a getting a little wonky for a moment about regulators. And there are regulators who really are in place, or like the FDA or Health Canada or the MHRA or European Medicines Agency. Their really purpose is to make sure that whatever goes to patients is of high quality and that the safety and efficacy are in bounds for the seriousness of the condition. That's one type of regulation. And those regulators have been supportive from day one. Uh, all they want is evidence because they're in the, their work is how do we make sure that patients get something that they can reliably benefit from? And we don't have snake oil salesmen on every corner overselling benefits to vulnerable patients. Those regulators have always been science first, show us the evidence. And in our conversations with them in many countries, they're really excited about this because they become regulators because they want to get things to patients. That's why regulators are regulators. It's not like going to the principal's office, right? Uh, these right. people want to, want to make sure things are safe. Now, the different regulators, are the ones who, you know, the drug enforcement agencies and so forth, they're a different type of regulator. And you're right, things are you know, still unfreezing there. And with good reason that, you know, they, 
these are not incredibly uh, things that you should be doing every day without any support or any kind of real understanding. So, you know, there is risk here. And so, you know, those regulators are now getting educated, being open to it. And you'll see that through decriminalization efforts and so forth. And I don't think anybody should go to prison for trying to change their consciousness. I think the real issue here is how do we ensure people can really benefit and reliably benefit? And we know who can and who can't. Sure. So how did you come to be involved in the psychedelic as, uh, as, a, as a mental health therapy field? Well, you know, it's um, life just hands you these things. So I think our story is fairly well known. Um, our son, uh, my co-founder, my wife, Ekaterina Mavskaya, and she's a doctor, a physician. Her son became really, really ill with depression, OCD. We didn't know what to do. The more people we spoke to, um, the clearer it was that we weren't alone. We like to say everyone has a story. I know many people we talked to were familiar with this really hard journey of what happened. And so sleepless night, she discovered psilocybin in 2013. She woke me up and said, you were in the 60s and 70s. What do you know about this stuff? And I said, well, actually a fair amount. And um, what that you know, led was a reconnection to this area. It had been an interest of mine many, many years ago in the late 60s, early 70s. And you know, what it enabled me to do is to see that there was real promise here. But what was missing is that a lot of the promise was focused on papers and publications. Really important. It's critical to get science ahead. But it's completely necessary but not sufficient to reach patients. And we were really motivated to bring things to people like our son so that others didn't have to war walk this kind of trial and error path that we had. So that's what drove us to do it. Um, I've had a lot of experience in collaboration, working with regulators on thorny issues in the pharmaceutical industry. So it just seemed like it was the right thing to do. Sure. Um, okay, so then the, the regulators are open to it. The FDA is obviously participating or facilitating your, your exploratory progress. What has been the results in terms of the success rate of using psilocybin to treat, treat various forms of depression? Well, we're focused specifically on something called treatment-resistant depression. Now, this is a weird statement because we've not met any patients who are resisting treatment. <laughs> this is really people who are unable to be helped by what we have today. Now, that's the study that we're doing. This is a group of people who currently are relapsing 80 to 90 percent uh, after a treatment. So this is a very grim place to be if you're a patient. And so that's what we're focused on. Early studies show that, you know, about 70 percent of people have some response. What we really don't know yet and why we're doing the work we're doing is we're doing the largest study. We're generating data so we can understand who will benefit, what's the right dose, and that all enables us to then go into how do we develop this at scale for patients. We're also training therapists. We're also looking at the set and setting. How is this applied best in a way that really provides safety, confidence for patients? So, you know, we have very high response rates, about seven, not we have, prior studies have. We don't know what our response rates are, and that's what we're really waiting for at the end of the year, to see what happens in a really well-controlled, well-designed study, studies that really haven't been able to be done before. So, kind of all eyes are on the end of the year for us, but we're very confident that, that there's progress. And I guess the last thing I'll mention, um, the first to study, an academic study designed by academicians, not by us, but it was a really interesting study. It appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine about a month ago. It was comparing two doses of our psilocybin at 25 milligram, a relatively high dose, over three weeks, compared to six weeks of the leading uh, antidepressant. And the study wasn't powered to be statistically significant, but directionally what was there was very encouraging. Um, and that showed that psilocybin was superior, numerically superior, on many dimensions, anxiety, depression, but also well-being, a sense of flourishing, with a really different side effect profile. And so, we, you know, I think we're really, really focused on, let's see what happens when we have the industrial strength, so to speak, study. That'll be out at the end of the year, but, you know, with a lot of promising signals. Wow, that's fantastic. And then, so in terms of the, uh, like you guys have 190 million in cash from the investor perspective, 
it doesn't look like you're going to run out of cash anytime soon. How, how expensive is it for you to get to the end of the year in this trial? And what are your projected expenditures for further research, assuming the success of this trial? Our view is that we are really well equipped to continue our work developing new compounds, shorter acting compounds that we're doing at, with the University of Sciences in Philadelphia. Um, we are also well suited to move into other indications beyond treatment resistant depression. Our focus is where patients aren't really helped by what's out there today. And so areas that we're focused on and starting studies that include PTSD, anorexia, um, OCD. So there's a whole bunch of things that we're working on. And, you know, all of that's expensive. It files at this level, the level of, you know, quality um, is very time consuming and costly. Typical medicines are a couple hundred million to bring to market. And so this is, you know, We've done a really, really great job with support of amazing investors to really make a difference in mental health care for far for people who just aren't helped today. Sure. Okay, George, we're going to have to leave it there for now, but this is fascinating stuff for me and for our audience. So we're going to hopefully have you back very soon. We're going to have all eyes on the end of the year. I really thank you for your time today. <laughs> you bet. Thank you so much. Appreciate thank it, you. James. You bet. Bye for now.